Welcome back to renowned physicist, Dr. Jeremy England, former professor of physics at MIT, author of Every Life is on Fire, currently a machine learning researcher in the biotech industry here in Israel. Good evening, Dr. England. Good evening. I wanted to talk this evening about the idea of creation, Bria, uh, in Tanakh and also in uh, traditions we have from Chazal. So I'll start with something from Pirkei Avot, um, which is a, a strange but famous passage, and then we'll we'll go into looking at Masad Bereshit a little bit in light of it. So we have Pirkei, Pirkei Avot, uh, chapter 5, uh, verse or section 6. Asarad varim nivreu be'arev Shabbat bin hashmashot. So there were 10 things created in the twilight on Erev Shabbat, meaning, you know, the very end of the, 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 the sixth day as the seventh day was setting in. Wehlohen, Pia Aretz. So these are the things that were created. First of all, Pia Aretz, the mouth of the earth, which pre refers presumably to the mouth of the earth when it swallowed up Korach and his followers. Ufi Habe'er, the mouth of the well. Uh, which presumably refers to the well of water that Moshe gave, uh, used to give water to the to Bnei Israel in the desert. It's often called the, the well of Miriam. Ufiha uh, Aton, the mouth of the female donkey, which is that of Bilam that he rode, which spoke to him in Barsha Bara. Well, Keshet, so the, the rainbow, the sign given at the end of the Noachic flood. Well, man, so the food provided to Bnei Israel in the Midbar miraculously by Kadosh Baruch Hu. Well, Mateh, the staff of Moshe that turned into a snake. Well, uh, Shamir, the Shamir we had a previous shiur about. This is the, uh, let's say, thorn or bramble or stone or worm or whatever it is that we associated with the splitting of rocks without using metal needed in order to cut stones for the temple, uh, for, for the for the altar um, that uh, was built by uh, Shlomo Amelech. Uh, so the letters, and the writing, uh, the tablets. Uh, and those that, there are those who say, uh, which is translated here is also the demons. Uh, and the burial place of Moshe, and, and also the, the Elo, Elo Shel Abraham Avinu, and also the ram of Abraham. Uh, um, and also some who say tongs made with tongs. So this is a very peculiar and cryptic passage. Uh, it's a famous one. Uh, it's a very interesting one. We probably don't have enough time to engage with every piece of this list, but it's good to lay it all out. Um, I think the, the significant thing we want to dig into here is that it starts off with asarad varim nivru. There were 10 things that were created. And we tend to think, okay, so this is about Maseh Bereshit, the creation of the world, and everything that was created, you know, everything that came at the beginning was being created because it begins, it all begins with Bereshit bara Elohim at the Shemaim Vatarit. So in the beginning, uh, Hashem created bara uh, at the Shemaim Vatarit. And then it all kind of falls under that heading of this is all just stuff that's being created. Uh, but actually, it's interesting to note uh, that every time you see uh, the word or the root associated with creation, uh, those correspond to specific moments that end up kind of making some sense in retrospect. So it's not the case that every single thing that Akadosh Baruch Hu does is called creation by the Torah. If we now go and we look through the description of Masa Bereshit, the seven days of creation, um, it begins, as we know, with Bereshit bara Elohim et HaShemayim v'et Aretz. So in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. But then, you know, when we go on and there are other things, it's Vayomer Elohim Yehi Or, and God said, let there be light. So it's just speech. 
And a lot of these other things are, of course, of invocations or separations. So let there and 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 God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. Or there are other instances where uh, Hashem does something and it divides. So Wayas or Wayavdel, He did it. He made it. He divided it. Something like that. Uh, and we don't get Vayivra left and right, and he created this, and he created that, and he created that. But we do get it in a few places. So the second appearance of the verb Vayivra um, comes down, actually, when we, we get to uh, this famous moment where we have the Taninim, seemingly. So people often note this, that of all these different animals that are being made, it says, Vayivra Elohim et Taninim Hagdolim. Okay, so that now refers to initially seemingly the creation of the great crocodiles, but also every other kind of creature alive in the waters and winged birds, and God thought it was good. So that's our second moment. And then actually in Masa we have a third moment, um, which we feel very entitled to as human beings, which is Elohim et Adam Elohim bara So there suddenly bara bara bara. We have this cacophony of the verb bara. Um, but in, in between, again, you know, when we're talking about various other things like the sun and the moon, or like this or that, um uh, uh, this, this this or that element of this whole process that unfolds over the course of seven days, it's not always being talked about in terms of uh, the verb livro, to create, or the root bara. And so what we're going to eventually try to do, I think, is return to this strange pyokei avot and maybe have something to say about it because we think a little bit about what this verb actually means. Um, and uh, to do that, first I just want to stay in Chumash a little bit and, and look at a few of these different instances where the, the root bara appears. Um, because I think that uh, that will help us to go back to this list, this very strange list of things made in the twilight before the seventh day, and maybe start to have a bit more of a sense of what they all have in common or what they're, they're supposed to be referring to. So I think the first thing to say is that it's interesting, actually, that in the present day, there are kind of three different things you might say about the world that are so sort of mystifying and puzzling at some level, either philosophically or maybe in sort of a, an empirical scientific mystery people are still trying to, to work out, um, or both. Uh, that there's always this temptation to 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 say this is the thing that somehow talking about this question provokes us to lift our eyes to the possibility of divinity. Um, even you know for people who are maybe not so inclined that they kind of admit there's something special about these questions, at least to the degree that if we could ever answer them without having to resort to talking about like those baruch then like that would really seal the deal. So what are these three things? I would say they are. First of all, and, and this is not actually a scientific question, it's more of a philosophical observation, but you know, why is there something instead of nothing, right? Like, why is there anything at all? And you can't do science on that question. You can always beg the question, well, whatever science you're doing with whatever theory you have of what is and why it works that way, why did it have to work that way? Why, why couldn't it work some other way? Why is there anything that works anyway? You know, all of that. That kind of question stands outside of the scientific thinking, and it's really just a, a uh, confrontation with the radical inability of those within the world to comprehend what it could mean for the world to exist or not exist, and, and for there somehow to be a choice to be made between those things. And I think it, it's maybe the most obvious that at some level uh, that is 
a question or a, a, a contemplation that's going to bring you into encounter with the idea of the divine. Uh, maybe not in a way that obviously connects with the Torah's account of things, but, you know, lots of philosophies come up with some kind of dead-end, first-mover kind of conclusion where they say, well, look, it all had to get going somehow, so what got it going? Um, and, um, and and I think that that is what that question stands for. So that's the first the first kind of thing that we could be we could point out maybe uh you can't get around asking questions that ultimately sound like you're making reference to or wondering about some sort of divine creator uh when you think in those terms why is there something instead of nothing then i think there also uh is what fascinates us about life uh and and it's incredible complexity and agency and exquisite architecture and there's something that seems profoundly uh well formed about it uh in in a way that is much less impressively well formed about just like a rock or a clump of sand that we find on the ground uh and and being unable to imagine how you get that from materials that aren't that way because we don't see that happen every day we see life produce more life but we don't see things that impress us as much as a frog or a bird would just springing out of inanimate clay or, or, or some, you know, more basic material. So it also presents this kind of sense of mystery. And this is something you actually can study. And, and, and there, this may be something where there is more kind of a, a science to be done on, well, how would you uh, start to try to think about what would get matter to behave in ways were more lifelike, but it still, I think, is a, a profound topic of contemplation for human intuition. And again, it always brings us into contemplation of the idea of a designer or a creator, even if you know we're also interested in the scientific question. Uh, one has to admit that naturally is a a topic for a discussion that people are going to bring in because of just how impressively well-formed life is um, and, and in all of this kind of purpose and form function relationship and architectural success and what have you. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing I would say is what we now in, in the present era call uh, consciousness or intelligence, right? Then we focus on what we think is most important about people and you know unique about people and impressive about people it's this very high degree of awareness and the ability to reason about the world and to uh make theories of how it works and to talk about it um and and so i don't know maybe you don't want to just say consciousness but you you would say somehow the the uniqueness of human intelligence uh, and of course, again, this is something that you can make into a more problematic discussion by saying, oh, well, what about other intelligences? Maybe there could be such a thing. Or are we really so much more intelligent? Is it really a matter of qualitative difference or just, you know, we're slightly smarter in certain ways and we're clearly dumber or less intelligent than some other creatures in other ways? Who knows? You know, but I, th I think that nonetheless, the, the separate and distinctive uh, qualities of, of the human mind and human language and human ingenuity and uh the, the the conscious experience that we feel ourselves to have and all of those things rolled into one there's something there again that we feel like if if nothing else does that that raises the question of is there a uh a sort of a, a maker or a an interlocutor a, a partner in communication for us to seek since we ourselves are so capable of cognizing and knowing and communicating so i just listed those three things uh and i think if you just presented those three things uh as a list you probably wouldn't get a lot of pushback saying oh you really left out something else that's hugely important to you know our typical path to seeking encounter with the divine um uh, and I think also it's hard to say that anything that we've made we, that we put on the list is hugely objectionable. And it's notable now that actually the three moments where 
the root bara appears in Maseh Bereshit really correspond to those three things, right? The first moment is Bereshit bara Elohim et the Shemayim et the So in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. That's the, why is there something instead of nothing question, right? That's the beginning of everything. Uh, and so uh, the the word bara, it doesn't, it's not even just the second word, it's the first three letters. So like Bereshit, is built out of the letters bit, bit, resh aleph, um, and so you you have this doubling even of bara bara right at the beginning, um, and that demarcates this moment this this moment of why is there something instead of nothing, um, and then you go on to what I mentioned before the taninim gedolim, and it's also interesting to read that pasuk where you focus on the Taninim Gdolim as the first thing that's listed and say somehow that the Torah specifically wanted to refer to the Taninim as being the things that were Nivra or Nivreu, right? That they were being created. But it says, mm-hmm. et etc. Et so actually it's and Hashem created the great lizards or crocodiles or sea serpents or whatever, and also every other kind of creature that lives in the waters and winged birds. And, and so that is, is day five, right? That's the beginning of animal life, right? That's the first point in, in, in which the Torah really talks about the creation of animal life, because at the end of day four, we just had land and water and sky and plants and the sun and the moon. And then it's on day five that you have Wyoming Elohim, Yishretsua Maim, Sheretz Nefesh Haya. So let the waters be filled with many living kinds of living things. And so he makes that statement, but then it says, Wayibura Elohim, it's a Tanini Magdolim, like and 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 the let the rest of the list again. So there's a demarcation, even after saying Vayomer, like that he says, let there be, but then we have to say Vayibra in addition, somehow to say, like, this is another moment. And that moment is not. Life in general, as we now, as a bio- as a biologist would call it, but animal life, and I think the reason for that is that the Torah pretty clearly understands a huge difference between plant and animal life, and it sees plants as part of the earth, it sees plants as part of the background, as as the setting, the stage on which things happen. We had another shiur talking about that. It comes before the sun and the moon instead of after the sun and the moon, and so everything before the sun and the moon is the stage on which the play happens. And everything after the sun and the moon is the actors. Um, and then in between, you have this idea of time, you know, and the time with, in, in which they all act on their stage. Um, but we take for granted now, oh, of course, you know, plants are made of cells and animals are made of cells and they all have DNA. And, and there's some notion of, of a common lineage. And of course, plants in their own right are hugely impressive. But at another level, they're much less dynamic. They're much more stationary. They if you don't tease everything apart into its separate little bits, there's much more of a sense that plants are just a thing that springs from the earth and it's like a property of the ground. So from the perspective of a person experiencing the world, you don't have this clean separation between non-living components of the earth and then also the cellular life that exists on the earth. But the earth just seems to be thriving with and and just rife with life of different kinds and you just you know there's always water there's always light and wherever there's anything in connection with anything on the ground it can give rise to a plant that colonizes there or some kind of mold or whatever else so the idea of you know tzmachim like stuff that grows on the ground that's part of the earth and part of the 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 background in, in the Torah's conception and then when you get to animal life, that's, you know, a thing that runs around and seems to have a kind of a personality and an agency um, that, that makes it autonomous, that makes it an explorer and an exploiter of its environment. Uh, and so I think that much more fully underlines uh, the impressiveness of life but, you know, it subdivides it. I think the point is that from the Torah's perspective, the earth is also impressive. And it was created, you know, Shamaim Va'aretz, and the Aretz, when it was created, that included to some degree this succession of events that, you know, involved the, the assignment of, uh, or the, the emergence of plant life. Um, but 
the creation of animal life is where we're demarcating this idea of there's something about uh, the the existence of higher forms of life that just is dazzling and and amazing. Um, and 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 again, kind of raises this question of like, you know, where do we come from? Uh, and, and then lastly, this third point um, that we mentioned that has to do with the sort of seeming uniqueness and distinctiveness of humans, that's the other moment where we have Vaivara, you know, the, the, that Hashem created people. And so um, you, you have uh these three moments and it so happens that you know in, in modern terms in those discussions we would say maybe those are the three kinds of things that the, the questions that fill us with a sense of yearning and and uh, contemplation and, and the torah knows to put vaivra on each of them um and i think actually if you look elsewhere at, at where the word vaivra appears in tanakh you get a lot of proof text for a very basic point that it's easy to miss which is that there's different ways of making things in the in the, the language of Torah and Tanakh. There's uh like you make, you know, or to, there's yotzer, you craft, or you form, you shape something. And those are very sensible ideas of doing something or creating or something, something or forming something. But you don't get a lot of appearances of Bara, like and someone made something, you know, oh I. I created my breakfast this morning, or I created uh, a sword in a forge, um, and 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 the, and and the the verb that's used is bara. Bara is actually used much more sparingly throughout Tanakh, and I would argue, and we I'm, I'm not going to go through every source for this, but you can dig up plenty of them. In every instance that I can find, uh, wherever bara appears or some use of that root, it's somehow about marvelous novelty it's about it's not just about making something forming something putting something together from something else it's about the idea of you you didn't even realize something like this could be and it's it's new on the scene it's a, a fundamental kind of chidush where it's it's a an innovation an introduction of something radically new and different um, and it's very often therefore associated with Akadosh Baruch Hu, because he's the one who can just sort of be mechadesh, masibrishit. He can bring in new things, um, uh, and and perhaps the best pretext of that is the one that we want to land on, as we were talking before at the beginning about pi haaretz, um, the 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 mouth of the earth, and that refers to a moment in the Torah, in Sefer Bamidbar where there's this contest of wills, you know, where Korach and his followers are rebelling against Moshe and Aaron. And, and Moshe uses this very interesting turn of phrase where he's saying, um, he's basically setting up a contest uh, where he's allowing Akadosh Baruch Hu to show that he sides with Moshe and Aaron against these rebels. So it's, it says, Wayomer Moshe, bezot tedon ki Adonai shalhani la'asof Et kol ha'ma'asim ha'ele ki lo milibi. And Moshe said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own mind. Im kamot kol ha'adam yimotun, ele uf kudath kol ha'adam yipaked alehim lo adonai shalhani. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they are visited by the fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. So if Hashem will create a creation, if, if a creation he will create, uh, or maybe you could say he, if he will surely create, or and in, in this translation it says actually, if the Lord creates a new thing, so it's, it contains this idea of novelty that I'm arguing for from elsewhere. Um, uh, as well in, in Tanakh. Ve'im b'riah yivra Adonai ufatsta ha'adama et piha, and the ground opens up its mouth, uvala'ana otam, and it swallows them, u'et kol asher lahem, u'yardu ha'im she'ola, and everything that belongs to them, and they go down alive to she'ol, 
Vidatem ki na'atsu ha'anashim ha'ele et Adonai. And then you will know that these men have provoked the Lord. And of course, we know what happens. It says, why he ichaloto ledaber, and it's as soon as he's finished speaking, et kol advarim ha'ele, these things, wati baka ha'adama asher tahtehem, watiftah ha'aretz et piha, so, and it came to pass that as soon as he finished speaking all these words, that the ground split beneath them, the earth, earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up in their houses and all that belonged to Korach and their property. Okay, so that's the, um, the main thing we want to focus on now, but there are many other passages in Tanakh where Bria, the idea of Bara, appears. There's this beautiful passage where Yeromiyahu talks about, and Hashem has created something new. Uh, it is that a, a woman is encircling and sort of courting a man, and, you know, it, but the emphasis there in that passage, again, is something new is created. And over and over, I think if you look and you see in Yeshayahu or other places, there's always this idea of total novelty or something surprising that it's not just I made a hammer yesterday and I made another hammer today and I'm a hammer maker and I, I'm a yutzer of hammers um, but rather that this is like the first time this has happened and it's marvelous and stunning um, and uh, it, it maybe is always associated perhaps with the Kadosh Baruch Hu, but if not then it certainly has the connotation of that kind of marvelousness but I think that the best proof text for that is the source that we just read it's about Pia Aretz now why is that? well I think that's the, the, the remaining thing that we want to do you know, in this discussion is just bring this back to uh, the Pirkei Avot that we started with Right, there were 10 things created in Benesh Mashot Nivru, they were created with the verb Bara and this list of things right uh, the, the mouth of the earth, this stunning moment where it wasn't just an earthquake, a sinkhole or whatever, it was the fact that a sinkhole opened under Korach and his followers immediately after Moshe finished speaking, after declaring that if such a sinkhole opened underneath them, that it would be proof that Hashem was siding with Moshe and Aaron. So it was a, a dazzling event. Um, and that's what makes it a, a, a bria, seemingly. Um, so there's the mouth of the earth, the mouth of the well, so that the water comes out of the rock. Um, that's also marvelous. You have the mouth of the donkey, like a talking donkey. That's a marvelous thing. The rainbow, uh, and uh, you know, it, it, as, as a dazzling sign, you know, maybe you could start to question a little bit because it is in another level part of the fabric of nature and reality and normalcy to see rainbows sometimes. Um, uh, but uh many of these other things are 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 seemingly marvelous but I, I think in a way you could actually say that when you go through the whole list like tongs that are made with tongs okay by the time we get to that point not obviously marvelous what's that even about or letters and writing that's not marvelous seemingly it's just you know uh something that we we read all the time the staff of Moshe is marvelous, manna was marvelous, Shamir was marvelous, but the grave of Moshe is a thing we don't know where it is. The ram of Abraham maybe was, was marvelous and momentous. Um, but, but, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't quite do it just to say, okay, well, these are all just kind of new things that, that each in their own way are marvelous. You, you're straining somehow to ask, like, what is what are the other themes that connect these things? It's not just about something that is new and surprising. And the thing that I actually would want to say that I, I see, and maybe it's hard to pull every single one of the things on this list together, you know, and and to do that before gosh in this discussion. So I'll focus on ones, um, uh, and and but I don't think it's necessarily wrong to make the same claim about the others. It maybe just takes more time to flesh it out. I think the theme here is nivua, or let's say hearing the voice of Hashem. It's, 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 if, if it isn't prophecy exactly, it's about the idea that HaKadosh Baruch Hu can talk to us in this world, right? That the events in this world bear a message to us that is 
a voice of his. Now, why do I say that? Well, it starts with pi ha'aretz. So in a sense, like the mouth of the earth, that is the, the claim. Like the rest of these things are, in some sense, commentary on that claim. But the first source is the point, right? A mouth speaks. <coughs> and in case you missed that point, shortly down the list, there's the mouth of a speaking donkey uh, to remind you that mouths are for speaking. Uh, and uh, of course, mouths also swallow things. And, and that's what is actually happening in the moment with, with Korach. But the, the, the larger point there is, is that the mouth is really speaking, right? It's sending a message. Moshe says, this is about the message. It's not about, you know, sinkholes per se. And if a sinkhole had swallowed up Korach and Moshe had not said what he did beforehand, it would be a little bit more sort of arbitrary. You'd say, okay, he fell into a hole. You know, maybe he could have been hit by lightning. It doesn't really matter. But because Moshe predicted it and said, this will say, this will speak from Hashem and say that, he sides with us, he sides with me and Aaron. Once Moshe said that, the swallowing of Korach by the mouth of the earth was speech from Hashem directly, affirming what Moshe had said. Um, and that is this moment where it's like, Im, yivra. you know, if he will create a creation or he will create, he will make some new thing, it's associated with the voice of Hashem just imminently coming into the world through a striking demonstration of his will uh, that has already been given all of this context through speech so you know exactly what it means, right? When that happens, no one says, oh, well, that could have just happened accidentally. And, and of course, this says nothing about what Hashem said to him on the matter. Moshe made a statement. It happened immediately afterwards. And that meant the words of Moshe beforehand now were the words of Hashem. And we're hearing them directly from Akadosh Baruch Hu. So <clears throat> I think Piha, it's the mouth of the earth, but this is about ultimately is the 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 willingness that Akadosh Baruch Hu has to speak to us through his creation. And that's why I think this all of these things in this list, why are we in Benish Mashot and Erev Shabbat? The reason is the twilight at the end of six days, it's raising the question. When Hashem speaks in his creation, is that part of creation? Like, is it part of nature? Or is it above nature? Is it somehow tampering with nature? And so you need it to be in this Benish Mashot, which is, is it part of the six days? Or is it afterwards? Is it not really part of Maseh Bereshit? Is it some kind of appendix to, to Maseh Bereshit? Or is it built in at the outset? And, and Chazal are, are playing very carefully with not wanting to, to make, give a clear answer to that question. And, and then once you, you have this idea of it's about Hashem speaking, you go down through the rest of them, and there are many others that really um, evoke that. So the mouth of the donkey is the easiest one. That was a moment where Hashem opened the mouth of a donkey so that a Malach Hashem would speak through the mouth of the donkey. And so it's about how sometimes if I got those Baruch who wants to talk to you, he'll talk to you through the voice of a donkey that miraculously speaks. And that doesn't happen so often, but uh, we're we're encouraged by the Torah to remember that nothing is beyond Akados Baruch Hu, and if that's how he wants to talk to you, he'll do it that way. And if he wants to talk to you a different way, then he'll do it that way. And and then these other ones start, they start to remind us, okay, sometimes it's not the mouth of the donkey. Sometimes it's a ram with its horns caught in a thicket in the exact place where you lift your eyes when you're about to sacrifice your son, and you suddenly see that, and you can say, Okay, that's not just an accident. That's like those Baruch who's sending me a message, sacrifices Ram instead, right? So that that isn't the same thing as a donkey opening its mouth and making sounds that you understand in your language. Um, but in another sense, it's an equally striking and miraculous occurrence with a clear meaning and a clear message, or one that it's possible at least to hear or discern. Um, the staff of Moshe is all about that because it's about all these wonders that Hashem, uh, or that, that Moshe performs where they show HaKadosh Baruch Hu's will and they affirm what Moshe has said, HaKadosh Baruch Hu means and intends. This is the staff that was given to perform the otot, to perform the signs 
so that Hashem's message would get through, through Moshe and through Aaron to the people. So the staff is also about that. Letters, writing, and tablets, that's the easiest, right? That's what communication is. Uh, it's, it's, and, and tablets is not just communication, but it's communication from HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself. Uh, and, you know, even other things, the Keshet, now we understand what the Keshet, the Keshet is something the Torah teaches us is a sign from Hashem. So if we didn't have the Torah telling us that, we'd say, okay, this is just a meteorological phenomenon. But the Torah explicitly says, no, the Keshet, the, the bow in the clouds, the rainbow, is a message. Uh, it does have meaning, and this is what it means. Uh, and, and so, you know, every one of these, you go through uh, water, you know, coming from the rock. Uh, the, 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 we have a very strong asogat that the water is Torah. Um, and, you know, that's why after three days, the people clamored in the desert because they didn't have water. So we read the Torah every three days. And the miraculous water in the desert is always associated with the idea of revelation of Torah. Uh, and you see that in various places, you know, Meribah and elsewhere in the Torah. And the last one, even tongs, you know, we didn't do almost, we did almost all of them, but I, I don't think it's so different with all of these other ones. But tongs is the last one because it, it's, I, I think, the most peculiar one. Um, but it really, um, you know, gives you the point in a, a useful way for, for how we're going to carry the discussion forward. Because what are tongs for? Tongs are for picking up something that's so hot that you can't pick it up with your own hand. And, and so you need to kind of hold it at arm's length through a tool that separates you from the thing that you're actually um, uh, trying to manipulate. And then, but it says, it doesn't just say tongs. It says tongs made with tongs which is this kind of infinite regress idea of, well, what if something is so hot that when you touch it with tongues, you need other tongues to hold the tongues? You know, the, the, it's, it's raising this whole question of, so what is it really talking about here? What, what, is the, what are the tongues holding? Well, where do tongues appear in Tanakh? They appear when Yeshayahu is having this vision and saying, I can't speak the word of Hashem. How can I speak the word of the creator of the world, when I am tame, I am impure, I'm just a sort of a impure or imperfect physical vessel. And what does the malach do? The malach takes tongs and picks up a coal, a red hot coal, and touches it to his lips and says, okay, now the tu'ah has been removed from your lips. So the, the idea of tongs here is about you're holding like the divine fire. It's, it's the, the very question of how could the word of Hashem manifest itself in the world without somehow that being a contradiction in terms where the whole world can't sustain it? How can there be imminence of a Kadosh Baruch Hu's will such that he can communicate without uh, running into some kind of contradiction of the world being unable to contain him and it all kind of not making sense or collapsing or falling apart? So this this notion of divine fire that's so hot that like you you can't even hold it with tongs you have to hold use tongs that hold the tongs um but but we have that as a as an exact explicit idea of how nivuah is to be understood through yeshayahu and navi that it's as though there's this divine fire the, like the hot coal touches his lips and removes the tumah from his lips and now he can speak the word of hashem um, and 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 so all of these things, I think, actually, this this pirkei avot is about how can it be uh, that there is nivua? How can it be that we can speak the word of Hashem even though He's not in the world, and He created the world, and His His creation uh, is not the same thing as Him, but it can still be the case somehow that His voice can enter His creation and can reach his creations and we can hear it and we can understand it and, and posing that question you know how can the earth have a mouth so to speak that speaks <laughs> um and uh, i i i think in the end uh maybe the whole point of this and uh, you know I, one should never say the whole point with passages like these but but for our purposes today the, the whole point can just be this that piharets um, the, the mouth of the earth in this moment with Moshe and Korah is really showing you the essence of 
how nibu'ah, how the idea of the imminence of Hashem's true voice in the world is supposed to work. Uh, meaning that it's it's first of all uh, the, the the completion of creation at some level, right? That that's why this is you know all this stuff is in Benish Mashot at the end of the sixth day. It wasn't mentioned in the Chumash, and so Chazal say, oh, we have to mention it. But what they're getting that from really is the mention of Bara by Moshe in this moment where Piaritz is going to swallow up Korach. Um, because all the other baras were in these like fundamental, even in modern times, the the existential yearning of humanity for an encounter with divinity. Why is there something instead of nothing? Why? How can it be that there is this marvelous thing called life or animal life, and with all of its dynamism and agency and form and function? Or how can it be that there are people with all of this intelligence and awareness and language and symbolism and all these things that we do that nothing else does. Those are the places where Bara appears. And then also we have Bara over with Moshe and Korach, and, and we can just glide right by it. It's just a flowery phrase that Moshe seems to be using. But no, what Chazal is saying is no. The appearance of Bara there is telling you the completion of creation. Like, Maase Bereshit, as far as the Bara in Bereshit, would not be done uh, except for Piaretz, except for the possibility that Akados Baruch Hu can speak to his creation in the world, and that that is part of how the world is made, that it's possible for that to happen. So that you don't just have, he made the world and press play, hands off, and now uh, the sort of tinker toys move around, um, and uh, he's not involved anymore, and he's not speaking to his creations, and he's not trying to have a relationship with them. Included in Maseh Bereshit is the possibility of that encounter, of that dialogue, and the possibility of his real voice being present and imminent in the world such that we can hear it and understand it. And if you want to understand how that's possible, because it sounds very hard to comprehend, you know, how that kind of thing could be possible and what it could mean, the example of PR, it's supposed to be a major proof text, you know, not the only one, and maybe these other sources kind of show you other examples where you can study that as well and get a little bit more context and points of reference. But the emblem of that is is this moment with Korach. Why? Because you have Moshe making a statement that he understands what it is that Hashem wants here and making that claim and making that argument to people and calling upon Shamayim Ba'aretz to witness, in a sense, right? Saying that, look, if I'm right, then the creator of the world is going to show that I'm right. Um, and I, I, I can expect that whatever in whatever way things happen, um, that they're going to happen so that ultimate, ultimately you'll be able to see clearly that only the creator of the world could have put his stamp on this statement that I'm making by allowing what happened afterwards to occur as I described. Um, and, you know, there's this question of, so so did Moshe know beforehand about the sinkhole? Because he had Ruach Kodesh, he understood from Hashem beforehand that this is what he should say? Or did he say it, and he went out on a limb, and because he was right, Ekadosh Baruch who said, okay, so I'll, I'll tell people you're speaking the, the untrammeled word of God. Because you got it right. And then you have the schut for me to, to step in and shape the world however it needs to be shaped in order for me to put my chatima, my signature, under the thing that you just said. Which, of course, isn't going to work if you are not on the money, right? If you're not saying what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants you to say, um, then you could make such a declaration. The ground will uh, remain solid uh, and you'll look like a fool. Or worse, some kind of Navi Sheker, like a false prophet. Um, so this is the high stakes game. But we do have these moments when Moshe does this, and you know when Eliyahu does this in the sort of contest with the prophets of Baal, where or when David is fighting Goliath. These moments where Hashem's name is on the line, and it, he, he his name is being championed by someone that has this chutz for Akados Baruch Hu to step in and say. Yeah, he's right. 
what he said, I totally agree. And I'll show you that I totally agree by making something marvelous happen. Um, and uh, that is so essential to the way the world works that Chazal made sure through this Pirkei Avot that they are really basing on an observation in the Torah itself, where this verb bara appears with Pia Aretz, they made sure to underline for us that Hashem, when He crafted all of creation, it was both, in a sense, part of creation and also a sort of way for Him to reach into creation uh, and, and be involved, uh, that the world is not just some kind of hands-off mechanism for Him to watch, like a stage with wind-up toys um, uh, performing some dance for him. Uh, it's a it's a partner. It's a, it, it's it's an interlocutor. It's a uh, a a, a, uh, a medium and a participant, a medium for and a participant in dialogue, uh, and and that that is a fundamental aspect of what the world is and how it works. Would um. Would you say that um, your thesis also applies to uh, historical events as vehicles of uh, ways by which Hashem uh, communicates with us? Well, so we've discussed and we've seen before miraculous events, and certainly. Uh, I think that we, we can talk about in the general theory of how this works, it doesn't always have to be this, as clean a case as what you see with Moshe. What you see with Moshe is one individual at one moment in time making this public declaration before a crowd. Here's how Hashem's word will be tested by exactly these parameters. And then now wait and see what happens. And you know, no sooner did he finish speaking than bang, you know, the trap door opens. So if you're Moshe Rabbeinu, <coughs> then you either have the confidence or the knowledge or both to make those kinds of gambles and win. Um, but I don't think that all the instances where you sort of, you know, you, where you hear the voice of Hashem in the events of the world are as clear-cut as that. Maybe some of them in our own individual lives can be in the sense that um, when when we're, not standing in front of a crowd, we don't have to draw as much on the bank of uh, needing to be a prophet of the caliber of Moshe in order for something very surprising to happen because we can be individually very surprised much more easily because we have a lot more details of our own lives to check against things and we can see things that you know only we realize about our lives kind of in the style of the Maron Yehuda where the modern hands you would die staff and seal in court, and only he knows what it means, right? So there, there's that element. There's the individual experience of the voice of Hashem where we can be stunned by things that happen personally to us, where we see Hashem's hand or we hear his voice loud and clear uh, because we have some kind of password that he's like thrown back to us that only we know. Um, and then it's as though it's like the earth is opened under us, except everyone else is just kind of going about their business around us, and they don't realize what a stunning moment this is for one individual with a unique access to certain information. So that's like at the individual level, how something like this can work. And you see that with Yosef Tzadik, we've talked about before with the spices of the Yishmaelim and the, the same spices that Yaakov sends, and other things, the, the Torah looks at this issue elsewhere. Um, but then, you know, if you're talking about national history, I think that um, if we're talking about other instances in Tanakh, clearly the, the voice and the, the style and the tone that the Tanakh takes when talking about these things, we have Kriyat Yamsuf, and we have these, you know, recapitulations of Kriyat Yamsuf, like with Chizkiyahu dealing with Rav Shakeh at the gates of Yerushalayim and the whole army of Saint Kharib is destroyed by a plague in one night, you know, where the, the Tanakh is going to talk about events in ways that 
emphasize the grandeur of the voice of Hashem, because you have a prophet like Yeshua who can step in and say, here's what Hashem said, and look, it happens. If we talk about 1967, if we talk about the Shah, like the War of Independence or things like that, I don't think it's as clear, you know, who was exactly standing on a hilltop and saying, let Avinu Shabbat Shabbayim, you know, bear witness and intervene and show that, like, we have come to reclaim our land, you know, and to keep his Torah here, and and these people have come here to defile it, and so, you know, now give us victory. Maybe someone said that. Um, it, it's not certainly how we tend to talk about that history now. But I think it's also not fair to say that there was no such sense in which that attitude uh, reigned to any degree, even despite the fact that, you know, it was a very uh, secular Jewish society um, for the most part during those two, you know, historic moments in the last century. Uh, who could avoid noticing that for the first time in almost 2,000 years, Am Yisrael were gathering back into their land uh, and, and that this was kind of a moment of the fulfillment of prophecy. And that was an idea on the lips of every Jew uh, during the period of the founding of the State of Israel in its early years, even if maybe most of the people who were inspired by the poetry of that didn't necessarily feel strongly that they could take it to the bank. There obviously were always some, but um, there were plenty of others who may have found it inspiring and nonetheless didn't feel sure that Akados Baruch Hu could be relied on, so to speak. Um, but when there's enough of an attitude of that kind, which there was, I think when you look at the victories of 48 and 67, it's hard not to uh, see Akados Baruch Hu putting his signature on things in the same way that he did with Moshe and Korah, with Pia Aretz. Um, And I don't think this means <clears throat> that we, we can just get so much more magical help if we start constantly declaring, well, uh, you know, if indeed HaKadosh Baruch Hu is on our side, then let us miraculously win this battle and that one and that one. Um, and, and, and then we'll, we'll get it even more easily in, in the style of Korach, because as we learned from Chazal, and as was also almost commonsensical from reading Tanakh, you'd really better make sure that you have enough credit in your account before you write that check, meaning that Akadosh Baruch Hu um, is concerned with the merits of Am Yisrael um, and his brit with us, but he's also concerned with our demerits and our failings and, and when we need to be taught a lesson. Uh, and so it's not near, it's not not at all to be taken for granted that all of this means that actually um, without having to uh, turn towards him and his Torah and all those other things and do that in the right way, that we get uh, all the backing uh, that uh, a master and, and king of the universe can provide if he wants to. Uh, so, yeah, I think you definitely can look for this in historical events, but I think that's always tempered by the degree to which the... The, the the facts of the historical moment are much grayer than the black and white situation that the, that the Torah gives us seemingly with Moshe and Korach. One could also say that the very words of the Torah are at one and the same time creations of Hashem and vehicles of revelation. Can you in elaborate sense, on what you mean by vehicles of revelation? What what you were saying before about how some things in this world are both uh, have two statuses at the same time, both things that were created by Hashem mm -hmm. and things that are used mm -hmm. to convey His will. I see. Yeah, like a medium, in other words. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that actually reminds me of a. It's a slightly bit of a tangential point. But I think it's a, an important one to make here, which is that, because what we're really talking about is Akados Baruch Hu's 
will and unlimited capacity to do things that look to us like intervention in the world. And it really, obviously from his perspective, you know, who knows what it is from his perspective, but it's somewhat silly for us to talk about what it was the difference between our not understanding what nature can do or his breaking the laws of nature temporarily. Like that, that is always happening inside a black box where we don't get to see uh, inside because we don't have enough information. So everything that happens that surprises us, you can always say, maybe it's because there's some law of physics you don't know. Maybe it's because you miscalculated because you were missing some numbers. Um, you know, you didn't know that there was an earthquake a thousand miles away yesterday. Um, and there was some tsunami headed towards you this whole time. Or, you know, the laws of physics change for a second or, you know, we're paused for a second. It doesn't much matter. It doesn't, epistemologically, those are all kind of indistinguishable scenarios in a singular moment where you can't do reproducible experiments. So it's it's often kind of a, a silly thing to get preoccupied with. <clears throat> so you know that in it, that was another aside. But I'm 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 saying that um, if we're talking about Hashem intervening in the world or doing things to us that show us His hand, that where His voice speaks and we hear it, which is not you know every moment of every day, and and suddenly it, it rings crystal crystal clear. Um, we're we're talking about. Uh, a, a view of how the world is and, and how it works that is obviously very uncomfortable in the in the present era because in such a scientifically influenced era where people think about the world as it works according to the way nature goes, they're, they're, uh, everyone is in a sense taught to understand the workings of nature as being indifferent, that there's a smattering of pure randomness here and there's a smattering of uh, implacable, unseeing, blind automaton law likeness over here, and it all mixes together, and it produces some result that's very interesting, and that we have to kind of survive and get along in and navigate. Uh, but it it doesn't necessarily have a message for you. It doesn't care about you. You know, th th those are the kind of popular. Uh, ways of talking about what the world is. If you kind of uh, look at uh, popular science or uh, public intellectuals of the high tech scientific West or what have you, right? And so, you know, when you when you when you take those kinds of perspectives, and then you say, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna push back and say, I think I got those Baruch whose will is expressed in everything that happens in the world, then. Uh, that is that that is something that people often try to knock down by uh, then turning towards the Torah and going after it by saying, "Oh, well, so then what you're saying is you think that everything in here is literally true." Um, but but look, we have this evidence that this isn't or that isn't. And so, you know, pick one, either science works or the Bible works, and you have to pick one. And and what's funny is that people set up this false dichotomy where they say, you have two choices. You can either say that the way you read the Torah is somehow, it has to be this very naive and what people sometimes call literalistic, although I think I don't like the word literal because I think the Torah is very much against the notion between, sorry, very against the, very against the notion of a clear difference between the literal and the figurative. Um, but even so, let's say uh, people imagine, well, if you believe that what it's saying here is true um, and that there is a God who created the whole world and he's king and, and all of this is an expression of his will, then you must have to also accept a reading of it that's somehow very childish and simplistic um, and also literalistic in certain ways um, that uh, someone else can amass a lot of evidence that they can say argues, you know, that that must be false. Or you have this other choice, which is to say, oh, it's all kind of figurative, including the fact that it says that Hashem is there and he's in charge of everything. 
and that's not really true it's just a sort of <coughs> um a set of stories that people tell in order to kind of um comfort themselves or in order to produce good behavior from people or whatever you know th th those are the two options that people are usually being asked to choose between but it it's funny you know, like once you think about it it's obvious that there's a, a third option here which is that it can both be the case that Akadosh Baruch Hu is a hundred percent as as real and as powerful and as unlimited in how to express his will and his creation as you can imagine, and more so. But it can also be the case that he chose to give us a book that you know had its deepest secrets and the deepest understanding to be had of it involves sophisticated reading of it and not like a childish sort of uh, what some people sometimes call literal, literalistic reading, uh, but one that embraces the possibility of multiple meanings that embraces the possibility of, well, this number here is really, you know, carrying a message for you that's about the numerical properties of the number and not just about uh, what Herodotus would say or what uh, an academic historian or archaeologist would say. Et cetera, et cetera. Like, if Hashem is really in control of the whole world, he didn't just write the Torah. He wrote War and Peace also, right? He wrote everything <laughs> that exists. He is responsible for and in control of everything that happened and exists. And it's really just a question of where he wants to put the message. He can put the message in Ma'asim Bereshit, when the earth opens under someone under certain circumstances, and he can put the message in a particular document. Uh, and it doesn't matter, in a sense, how the letters got in there, first of all. Like whatever historical or archaeological process you want to imagine for that, he's also in control of that, right? And the result of it is whatever he wants that to be. And it can also be the case that the, the text itself, as you were saying, like going back to your original point, it is both uh, the, the medium for his message and it's also um, something he created. <laughs> um, and, and so uh it, it, it is uh it can be thought of as uh like everything else being authored by his hand but the point is more that he told us that he has things he put there for us to study and he wants us to find them out there but the way we find them out no one ever told us and like those baruch who didn't tell us the way you find out my message is you have to read this thing like an incurious five-year-old or like a pagan who just got off the train from ancient Greece or ancient Egypt, Egypt 10 minutes ago, um, or, or any other number of ways that you could read the text where it seems to you to be saying something that's sort of like hard to make sense of. Um, so I, I think that's the, the sort of third way that has to be argued for here, um, and, and that we need to remember is that the statement that the, that the Torah gives us that Hashem is fully in charge, let's take that as the premise. And then if that's the case, he wrote the Torah, it's not difficult for him to do. Uh, and it doesn't even matter how he did it um, and through what means in this world that came about um, because he's the author of the Torah. He's the author of every other piece of creation, but it's where did he want to put his true message? And how do we discern that and what are what's our our methodology for extracting that message and carrying it into the world so that we can see how what we find in the Torah coheres with what we see in the events of the reality we perceive. I would just comment that you could also say that the uh, way of seeing um, the letters of the Torah as both a creation and a medium can also be said regarding the Tosha Balpeh. And, and wisdom that's come through the Chachamim, the, the scholars of the generations. And it can also be said that what you said about the need for sophistication uh, regarding to the written Torah, can, can also, that can also be stated regarding the oral law, that there's a need uh, uh, to have a sophisticated approach towards that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think that. The, the, the point of piharetz, the mouth of the earth, the, part of the reason it's so important in a way that the sages are underlining for us is that at the end of the day, 
if we're looking at this moment, you know, Korach rebelling against Moshe, what is that about? That's about the question of what the Torah means, right? That there's a there's a political revolution that's brewing under Moshe because there's an argument about what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, it's up to a Kadosh Baruch Hu to make the judgment of who's right. Like, you know, we make our arguments and we decide, you know, who's convincing. But like we said before, yes, Kadosh Baruch Hu is the author of the Torah. He's the author of Torah Shebal Peh. He's also the author of War and Peace. He's also the author of the Zohar and other Kabbalistic works. Um, but the point is, you know, he's he's the author of everything, including a whole lot of falsehood that is part of um, the reality that he has created. Uh, and he doesn't want us to take every piece of reality and, and see it uh, as a message that we can use to decide how to act. And so what, what has to happen is people have to make their play of, all right, let me state my methods. How do I know what Hashem wants of me? This person over here will say, I'm going to find out what Hashem wants of me by reading the Torah, by reading the Vim, by reading Tuvim, by reading the Mishnah, by reading the Gemara. That's, you know, a very, and obviously, you know, other sources, commentators, whatever, latter post scheme, et cetera, who help us to make sense of those sources. But the, the, the standard package of rabbinic Judaism or whatever you want to call it, had those fundamental sources as the ones where you you start from there and you don't try to expunge or edit those parts, but you try to grapple with them and then you work out the rest. There are others who have attempted other methods, right? There are people who have said, we need less than that. We don't need Torah Shibar Peh, right? The Stukim are no longer around. Um, and it's seemingly because Pia Aret swallowed them up, so to speak. Um, and uh we we also have people who maybe trying to add some things, which is, by the way, Asur, according to the Torah, like Lotosifu, you're not supposed to add to the Torah. But there are people in the present day where the way they act, um, it's as though they're learning new or other Torah from latter Kabbalistic works, essentially. And then it becomes part of their practice and it supersedes things that are really coming from uh, Torah Shebikhtav and Torah Shebal Peh. Um, and so those become divergent methodologies for how do we find out what a Kadosh Baruch Hu wants us to do. And to some degree, the test of time shows if a Kadosh Baruch Hu approves of one or the other. Um, and it may not be that all of those you know, issues are, are, are fully empirically resolved yet. Uh, but uh, we, we have to state our method and make our gamble, so to speak, um, and 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 we find out iteratively how right we are, and maybe we can get the message from the world around us and change if we if we're wrong. So maybe we can realize, you know, we need to be more open to something, or maybe we can realize we need to be less open to something, um, because uh, Hashem is helping us to figure out um, that uh, we're on the right track or or not. Uh, but the sources we're working from um, are something that we can be reflective about and be open about uh, and then make the case on that basis. And ultimately, I don't know, uh, 10 years from now, 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, as was the case in the past, if there are different games in town right now for how to argue for that methodology, some of those may not lead down a path that lasts uh, all the way to the end of the line. You could look at the conservative uh, movement in America and, and how so many conservative temples have now become Korean churches and uh, see how what was once a very dominant movement in America has now uh, is now basically in a rapid decline. Yeah, I mean, it's very sad, but I think that is a recent and striking demonstration of phenomenon that we're talking about where I think you could uh, being generous say that especially at the beginning of that movement there were those involved in leading it where you could say they they had the sincere desire of some kind to argue for this 
new methodology as a proper methodology for serving Hashem. Um, and it's it's proven to be a movement that largely can't perpetuate itself and also that can't even hold the line in maintaining itself um, in a in one place with uh, constant standards about a variety of things. Um, and uh, so the, the, the sort of sinkhole phenomenon of Korach is, and this is true of many things in the Torah, you know, you have creation in seven days, and then you have these kind of Shabbatot of seven years or seven times seven years. There's all these different time scales on which the world works in actuality, and the Torah tells us that. So it's not always that the sinkhole just opens its mouth and Korach and his followers go down the minute after Moshe stops speaking, but it might be that a century later, you know, on that time scale, in the blink of an eye, the same kind of thing happens. And it doesn't have to mean that also that people are underground in a, a geologic sense, um, but but it can still be the case that uh, their, their connection to Torah uh, amounts to as much. It is interesting how you had that prototype of Korach, which served as an example of uh, that which we would see over and over again, uh, this type of theological challenges that continued to throughout Jewish history. Yeah, and I, I, I guess... Since it's Lag Baomer, I can't help but thinking about um, whether the model from Korah is meant to cover everything or whether there are different models that the Torah gives us. Because we also have Nadav and Avihu, for example. Like, what's the difference between Korah and his followers on the one hand and Nadav and Avihu on the other? Um, Korah is more objecting to the structure of uh, castes or priestly designations or, or what have you that exist within uh, the, system, the system that Moshe um, is, is telling the people, you know, this is what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants, uh, and, and calling for maybe more kind of egalitarianism and therefore also kind of elimination of the Kiddushah, you know, the separateness of the, the, the Kohanim, and implicitly, therefore, maybe also the, the separateness of Am Yisrael and, the, and their Kiddushah relative to the nations. Now, there's this Midrash about how Korach um, is arguing with Moshe about whether or not a garment that's made entirely of Tchelet needs to have Tzitzit or not. Um, and And... So there's this issue of the, the one blue thread as like the separate color that's different from all the rest. And, and that's the thing that he's kind of um, trying to argue against by saying, no, it's all Tchelet, we're all, we're all Kadosh, and, what, and what, you know, Kulam Kedushim. And that's different than the Levin of And the Levin of view is, I, I think, you know, when I think about the um, the bonfires in Har Meron and all of the uh, halfway there to Abu Dazara or maybe more severely almost there to Abu Dazara, Abu Dazara or already there and that whole spectrum of, of, of practices that we now have going on in, in Agba Omer where we're lighting sacred fires at, at graves of people whose ghosts are expected to um, give us blessings and, and how much that just sounds like totally forbidden um, idolatrous practice according to the Torah that sounds much more to me like Nadav and Navi, where they're bringing in Esh Zara. They're like lighting a fire that was not commanded by Hashem. Um, and that also carries with it, um, you know, ultimately a similar kind of result. Um, but I think there's somehow, there's a difference in the sense that if I'm comparing those events, in the case of Nadav and Navi, there was kind of a a misplaced sincerity and their desire to somehow draw near to Hashem, and um, they just were getting it wrong by by allowing themselves to make up new means of doing that, and that's highly problematic. 
And in that instance, no one had to stand up and make some kind of declaration saying, like, let Akados Baruch Hu judge between you and me. There was not some event where someone first indicted them and then argued that Nadav and Avihu had done something wrong. It just happened, right? The fire consumed them. So there was something that it wasn't uh, based on some kind of disputation uh, over what how, how things should be done correctly or not, uh, at least in the actual verses that we have uh, in, you know, Parshat Shemini. Uh, and then you go over to Korach, and there's much more this sense of, like, first we're going to have a big conversation about this, and, you know, we're going to argue about what's right, and then call upon Akadosh Baruch Hu to bear witness, and, like, you know, we'll see who who is right, because Hashem will show us. Uh, and so that's a that's a significant difference. Uh, and I'm, I'm thinking about this on the fly, so I'm not sure whether you could say both of those models apply if we're talking about, you know, Lag uh, Be'omer and the troubling amount of near Abu Dazara or Abu Dazara that happens on Lag Be'omer because of the worship of Rishbi and all of that. Um, maybe both of those models apply each in their way and you'd have to kind of think carefully about how they line up. Or maybe on the other hand, you could say, no, this is an Esh Zara, Nadav and Aviyu kind of situation. Hands off, let HaKadosh Baruch Hu deal with it. <laughs> uh, versus some other kinds of arguments between different sectors uh, of Am Yisrael that um, maybe are more or less comfortable with the kihuna of the Kohanim or with the kihuna of Am Yisrael relative to the, the nations, um, where there has to be kind of a public debate at some level and um, and some kind of a demonstration before the eyes of everyone that someone understands what's going to happen um, uh, when Akhidosh Baruch Hu is demonstrating how he feels about the matter. Thank you very much, Dr. England. My pleasure as always. May we soon see as much uh, enthusiasm for the Temple Mount as we do regarding uh, Maron. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.